Welcome everyone, I'm Lorelei Tanji, University Librarian at UC Irvine. Our newest exhibit, Ant Eater Spirit, Student Activism That Shaped and Reshaped UCI 1965 to Now. And this exhibit will be on display for about five months until mid-April. The exhibit explores six decades of campus activism at UC Irvine and shares how students helped shape campus spaces, curriculum, and culture by revisiting how each generation mobilized to increase campus representation and improve student life, our curators show that UCI students have made their voices heard on topics ranging from tuition costs to housing equality, free speech, and civil rights. The Ant Eater Spirit exhibit uses materials from UCI Libraries, University Archives, and brings together more than 100 original photographs, archival materials, and videos with a special focus on UCI's history and its unique character. And indeed, there is a special section dedicated to our UCI mascot, Peter the Ant Eater. My, my time at UCI and with my work, uh, just because I started my podcast and the web series with my, my friend Sydney and uh, my co-hosts during a time where there was a lot of social unrest and uncertainty with the pandemic, and so just being able to talk about what was going on in the world at that time with a fellow woman of color and a fellow student was really cathartic for both of us, and I feel like that was, uh, it was a time where we were really able to relate to each other in a really deep way uh, with everything going on in the world, so. How my personal identity influenced my time, my activism as an undergraduate. Um, in the beginning, I was born. No, just joking. <laughs> um, well, I was born in Seoul, Korea. Came to the United States in 74 at the age of seven and my father had the grand idea that we would grow up in Bakersfield We would plant roots in Bakersfield and at that time There were so few Asian Americans, let alone Korean Americans Our family photo made the front page of the Bakersfield, Californian with a headline that said Korean family arrives <laughs> and therefore to answer your question I think that coming onto the university campus was a time of discovery, discovering my identity. It was really the first time that I found the opportunity to hang out with Asian Americans, Korean Americans. Um, that was not an opportunity that I had much of growing up in Bakersfield, California in the 70s. So lots of pondering, questioning myself, and availing myself to ask questions and be curious and uh, consider responses from students, staff, faculty. And um, so that's part one of how my identity helped influence my life at UCI. So, you know, my parents came to the United States in the 1960s. They met here as immigrants. And so I was born and raised in Southern California and um, pretty much had a pretty regular childhood until I would say 1979 when, or maybe a little bit before that, when the Iranian Revolution happened. And so my parents were from Iran and, and it was the first time in which my normal kind of childhood growing up turned into a little bit of kind of submerging my own identity, I think, for a while. Um, it was not really as safe for my family or myself sometimes. You know, my dad's shop got vandalized many times growing up. Um, he was a TV repairman. Uh, I, myself, would be accosted with, you know, where are you from, where are you from? And I'd say Persia. And if they were not giving it, then they'd let me go. If they got it, they'd be like, hey, that's Iran. Um, and, you know, had those kind of moments being called names or maybe 
other things happening. So it was a time where, you know, I certainly could get away with a lot of privileges. Uh, you know, I don't have an accent. You know, until you learn my name, you might not realize I'm from a different background. But uh, certainly that was kind of uh, what was shaping me at the time. And coming to UC Irvine was, was an, a, a, a great time, really, an opportunity. You know, I had to work throughout my time to pay that $500 a quarter tuition, oh which doubled to 1000 by the time I left. Uh, but, uh, and I joke about that because it really is reflective of a different time when the state really supported uh, students and student tuition in a different way. So giving back makes a lot of sense for all of us that were from that era, at least. Um, and I always thought that I would want to do some type of public service, because even though uh, I think growing up when you have parents that come from a different country, you are just accustomed to learning about different ways of life and learning about different ways to approach problems and different ways the world looks at things differently, perhaps. And so I always thought about myself going into public sector uh, in some capacity. I was a political science major. Um, you know, when I was here, I had, you know, one of the great things about a quarter system is you get to take lots of different classes and you can experiment a lot. And so you know, I would take African American culture class, I'd take a Japanese culture class, I'd take a Chinese history class, I would take uh, anti-apartheid class. And in fact, my professor, Dr. Songola, would say it's apartheid, because you can hear the hate in the word. Mm -hmm. And I think um, when I would take those classes, it really certainly enlightened me even further in terms of a kind of a passion. And that was probably one of the big issues in the 1980s when I was a student here in the late 80s. I'm the oldest of the bunch here. Uh, and that, you know, the apartheid in South Africa was one of the big topics. And certainly lots of protests here, even on our campus uh, at that time. And I was a political science major, so I did a UCDC internship. I, I interned in Washington, D.C. for the Democratic National Committee. It was an election year. I got to go to the convention and, and schmooze around and do all those great things at that time. And I was, came back as the president for the Students for Dukakis, a losing cause at that time. Uh, and really, honestly, I was the president, but I really didn't do too much with the actual organization. I was just the signer, and they wanted me to be the person that you know, signed us up or whatever. Uh, but, you know, I was pretty active in that campaign. Um, and then, uh, in an interesting way, I had lots of great mentors here where I fell into this thing where I worked in higher education. But certainly, you know, I think those were a lot of the influences at that time, and that era of my lifetime, just reflecting upon it for this, for this panel. Um, and certainly, it's still a, a, an opportunity to always want to give back, I think, was kind of engendered in me from my parents. And, and education was always important to my family. Uh, immigrating here. So I think those were kind of the things that I've held on to. And obviously, I've worked in higher ed for 30 plus years and stayed in working in different institutions. So I found my passion in that way. Um, okay, so for me, uh, I guess in terms of my identity, I identify as Chicana. And so I'm a second generation Chicana. Um, I've known that word since I was a kid because my parents were active um, in college. And, um, and I knew coming into college that I was looking for Mecha. Um, and that is because my parents met in Mecha when they were in college at LMU. Um, and so that lens, that activism, Cesar Chavez, like I didn't grow up eating grapes, for example. We boycotted grapes my whole um, life, um, except when grandma, grandma didn't abide by that. So we, I got to eat grapes at grandma's house. Uh, but, uh, but for me, that was just, it was, it was part, it was ingrained in me in terms of uh, what I wanted to do in college, how I wanted to be involved in college. Uh, and so I just was heavily involved in Mecha. I was welcome to the cross at the time Anna Gonzalez uh, was the director. Um, and talked about her experience at LMU and because her last name being Gonzalez, she was brought into Mecha while she was at LMU. And so I, because of my parents' background, I identified with that. And, um, and so I met her like the first week. Uh, and so the whole time, I think, you know, growing up, I never knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, and so my whole college experience was seeing um, Anna doing that work, now Dr. Gonzalez doing that work, and, um, and saying that's what I want to do. You know, she is organizing students, she's helping coalition build. We are working together as students to um, bring rallies, to bring attention uh, to, to different issues on campus. And, um, and so for me, it's just, it's, it's you know, it was, it was there. I mean, part of like my family history is my dad shut down the UCLA Law School when he was in law school. Um, they, they both went to UCLA for their um, professional degrees. 
And so, um, so actually, they just started sending me pictures that were discovered from that time period from the news articles. Uh, and so I, I didn't go that far, um, you know. I, I, uh, you know, we met with Vice Chancellor Manuel Gomez for different causes, but we didn't shut down any buildings at the time. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but to me, that was that's always been part of my identity, and and um, and working at the Cross Cultural Center and and being an intern there when I was in college as well uh, was just uh, how I think I developed and grew as a person. Um, and was able to now continue doing that and giving back in, in my uh, career. For, the, for those of you interested, in our second case on um, early student organizing, we have some really cool documents from early Mecha records as well, so if you want to take a look at those um, after we wrap up. All right. How it has changed and how students work with one another. You know, in looking back, because I have been here in the 80s as a student, I worked in the 90s for five years, I left, and I came back in 2006, and I've been here since. I would say that in the 90s, the 2000s, um, I would see a lot of coalition building between student organizations, student organization leaders, really coming together to work on figuring out what are the things we want to advocate for, and we have more power when we work together in terms of that advocacy. And so, you know, I, I advise the Umbrella Council, the organizations that make up the uh, Cross-Cultural Center, the Black Student Union, MECHA, Alianza, APSA, and ASA, American Indian Student Association, and Asian Pacific Student Association. And um, for one, for one like, year, basically. And they would, the, the chairs would actually meet. They would talk, okay, what's our issue this year? We're gonna advocate for ethnic studies on campus, and we're gonna push Manuel Gomez on this issue, and we're gonna push the faculty on this issue, and or here's another issue that we're gonna focus on this year, and this is gonna be our intentional focus for the year. And uh, so there was a level of organization that I think was really, um, uh, I think, positive in a lot of ways. It was, it was a strength in that, I think. I think in the 2010s, what I've seen, a slight shift in, and I don't, I know there was a part where I think some of the leadership of these organizations felt very taxed, very burdened, very overwhelmed with the, the workload, the burden of kind of carrying all kinds of things, being a student, being a student leader, being a member of this club or organization and advocating, et cetera. Where there may have been a slight shift that I see in that the student leaders uh, were starting to, to kind of just do a little bit more of self-determination, independence in terms of where they were and where they're at and what they're gonna advocate for. So it was a little more of a shift to say, we're gonna advocate for this cause if we're a member of this organization. This is important to us. And if you wanna get on the bandwagon, you can, but we're not gonna wait for you. This is our issue, we're gonna advocate for it, we're gonna make noise about this, and we're gonna be independent in how we advocate on that, uh, on behalf of this issue or topic. Um, and, and I think the slight difference there is that um, the active participation in student leaders across various or, uh, organizations or student leadership positions coming together to advocate is, is a little less, I feel like. And that's just my analysis. It's a little bit of my opinion right now in terms of that. And that it's kind of fallen on the shoulders of we're going to advocate for ourselves and this is an important issue for us. And so we're going to determine this for ourselves. We're not waiting around for someone else in that regard. And there's strength in that too. Uh, but I also think there's uh, there's something missing a little bit, or it's a little different than what it was before. And the outlook is just a little bit different in the framing of that. So I know that's a long-winded answer, but I think as I've thought about this question a little bit, um, that's how I would characterize the little subtle shift that's happened when it comes to advocacy with, with student organizations on our campus to some extent. And so that's what I would add to that. And so to bounce off of um, what Ramin said is, is I think part of that has, part of that self-determination is also that there's this, um, you know, they, the students will start organizing before even having the conversation with an administrator of what is possible. Um, and so some of this fear of meeting, right, it's, it's this um, us against them versus first checking in, we might all be on the same page. Yes, we need this resource. How, how can we help you advocate, right? And so sometimes we feel there's, there's um, I, I guess, missed steps, right? Opportunities for that advocacy that hasn't been happening as much lately. Um, and then the other part is part of that social activism now, 
uh, is all happening on social media, right? And students are communicating very differently than they used to. The, they don't, um, you know, when there are protests or rallies, uh, the crowds aren't the same, right? The students may not be directly as involved anymore because there's a lot of union related ones lately. Um, it's not it's not the same because all the messaging is happening through social media, all the outreach, the petitions, it, it can all happen online. It doesn't need to happen in person. Um, so I think that to me, that's a big shift um, in, uh, in how, um, how activism ha happens now on campus. Thank you. I was thinking of that too when I was looking at the documents. Like, oh right, before the internet, people had to rally and print off lots of copies and walk around campus <laughs> rather than get online and share and tweet and these kinds of things. So that's really interesting. Thank you. I think that both of those projects had a lot to do with what both Ramin and Adelie just said about self-determination uh, as a student, just being able to control uh, the narrative that's coming out about news that is affecting you know, communities that you're a part of. And I think Sydney and I really drove that home with uh, Black Fam 2.5 because we just saw that there wasn't a lot of black news within the space that we were in, within a chiefly non-black uh, journalism program here and we wanted to see more black news and so that's a big reason why we started the podcast in the first place and then you know COVID happened and then the resurgence of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement happened and we just saw a real need to drive home more uh, more news about what was happening in the black community at the time and on campus and so it started as a podcast about the black community at UCI, the small group of us that was here at the time. And then as you know, we noticed that more and more was happening in the world, we expanded our view outward. And um, you know, we wanted to make sure that the narrative that we were speaking about, the news that we were speaking about was, you know, um, we made sure to invite on guests that were able to speak to it, not only because of their profession, but because of their background, because that relates to the truth of what we were speaking about. So I think it was an outlet for us to digest what was happening in the world to the community that we were a part of, but it was also a way to speak to people who were trying to do the right thing and to fight against what was happening out in the world as well. Thank you, that's super interesting. And I was listening to one of your episodes on my drive here today over a coffee, The Power of Black Women, and you guys talk about misinformation, and as a librarian, I was like, yes! <laughs> and the, the risk that that has for voting and all these sorts of structural issues. <laughs> um, I also want to highlight for our audience that the exhibit has some amazing student-run alternative media examples, um, including a print issue of The Blade, The Cutting Edge of Change, which was founded by ASUCI in 1975. So we have an issue from 1988 that's highlighting the Black Awards Banquet, the 12th annual uh, Black Awards Banquet. Um, and then we also have an issue from Rice Paper, which was a student-run alternative newspaper that ran from 1991 through 97 and focused on Asian American issues through articles, letters, uh, poetry, and art. So you can take a look at those. I want to say a few things before answering that specific question, um, which is that, okay, so the Waze Goose protest happened in 1991 where more than 200 protesters expressed themselves about the need to um, formalize ethnic studies and for the Asian American Student Coalition, they were obviously championing Asian American studies for it to become uh, a department, a major, a minor. So that's 1991, and um, when did it become a minor? It became a minor in 1996, and then it became a major in 1997. And um, right now I teach a course called Art and Activism for the School of so Social Sciences, and one of the articles that we read is authored by a journalist named Nathan Heller who uh, gets the reader to think, you know, are, pro are protests a waste of time? And he, he, exam he has the reader examine some modern protests and 
and confront the the reality that that protest has not resulted in an outcome that potentially those protesters were arguing for. And, and in that article, as the students in my class read it, um, they get super bummed out thinking maybe it isn't, maybe all these protests don't make a difference. And, and Heller does a good job of um, citing some books that push back on his own question. One of the books uh, whose author, the, the names I don't remember offhand, but uh, making the argument that, that sometimes, even if the next day or the next year or immediately thereafter, the Waze Goose protest or uh, something else, maybe there's this thought that Heller's question is right. Maybe protests don't make a difference, but but the the pushback being that cumulatively uh, protests and expressions create an arc that does help ultimately not just the ability to mobilize, which is super easy and super fast, especially these days with social media, but those who have the skill sets to also pivot to. Uh, organizing, which takes a lot more time, and it is a longer game, and negotiating and compromising and listening, um, and how that can frequently lead to the Montgomery bus boycott, the major of Asian American studies that comes way after the Ways Goose protest. So that that's, um, so to answer the question why, because students are smart and they want to get attention at a very, very uh, uh, important event for UCI, which is now called Celebrate UCI, uh, to say uh, in this middle of the celebration, we'd like to bring attention to um, certain matters. And um, the other thing, I, if I could spend two minutes to kind of piggyback on the topic that, that was talked about, um, you know, I think one of the things that, at least in my class, we are grappling with is that with social media, uh, our attentions are being robbed. We are living in a, a, a state where our attention is currency, and uh, students are tempted to and, and want to um, perform front stage activism and get kind of famous, but there is this after work that requires more restraint. And so Nathan Heller in the same article goes to uh, review the Montgomery bus boycott about how when Claudette Colvin, the 15 year old ha who had been arrested for the same reason that Rosa Parks got arrested. The NAACP at that time had been incubating the idea of unleashing a bus boycott, but they practiced restraint because they felt that Claudette could not withstand the media scrutiny of being the figurehead for this bus boycott. So, so the idea of restraint for protesters today, I think, is a, a, a new concept and timing and auditioning who is the right person and then launching it when it's the right time. And then also to confront the, 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 the reality that the pro, that boycott was supposed to last one day, but it lasted 350 some days, more than a year, because there, were, there was a, a carpool network of 320 car, car vehicle network that was run by volunteers to allow people to get to where they needed to go by volunteering to drive you for over a year so that you didn't have to ride the bus. And so that kind of um, organizing, which is different from mobilizing, which I think students are really good at right now, mobilizing, and actually clamoring to get that, that vein. And uh, the restraint the beauty of restraint, the beauty of organizing for the long haul. Can you can you show up for two two days a week for a year and drive these people to where they need to go? Can you bring a casserole to the next meeting? That that activism doesn't necessarily have to be uh, with a picket sign 
yelling, but it could be driving a car for a whole year so that people refuse to board the bus. Anyway, so Waze Goose was uh, a vehicle to get, to amplify uh, the voices that, that wanted to argue that our, our curriculum needed to become uh, diverse and students are smart and they, they know where the, the audience is. So that was, that was Waze Goose protest of 91. I love it, thank you. Thank you. Well, I think that it's important because the work is really never done. Uh, problems are ever evolving and even if things get better, there's always something that, there's always someone who's gonna need a hand and there's always someone who's gonna need a voice and if you could be that voice and find a way to be heard, then you should, you should do that in any way you can. And for my friend and I, it was journalism because that was something that we were very passionate about and we came together and we were lucky enough to start a podcast together and our web series, but you could really do, like Jenny was saying, activism could be, you know, driving a casserole, it could be driving, you know, so someone could have access to you know, resources, it could really be anything. So you should never feel that you should be pigeonholed to a certain uh, type of protest or activism. Pro activism can just be showing up and being kind and, you know, being vocal in any way that you know how and what makes sense for you. So, you know, like I said, the work is never done. Uh, in a lot of ways, colleges, uh, it's a microcosm for the real world and it is the real world, so you should never uh, think that you're too young or not experienced enough to start now and do the best you can to make a difference because you definitely can and you should do that in any way that you can. I think it's so easy to, to comfort myself within rooms where everyone are, they're like nodding, you're so right! Um, and it's harder to enter rooms where I'm having to defend myself or sharpen my argument. And I, I would argue and advise students to enter those rooms and sharpen your arguments and learn to listen and to be able to push back and say, I disagree with that and I hope you have a good day. How are your kids? I, I, I think that there, ultimately we want to coexist we want to change minds. It's not going to happen if we're in rooms thinking that we're so great and we're always right and they're always wrong and don't ever talk to administrators because they're the enemy. So that's my advice. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think the question was, why is it important that students continue to reshape the campus? Um, and I think it's, you know, I have a privilege, and that's, I work at a university. I get to actually meet a lot of our incoming students, our first year students, and I get to talk to them. And um, what I try to share with them is, it's important because the world needs help. I mean, the world we live in needs a lot of help right now. Um, when I was here at UCI, I, I watched a, um, a, a footage that Randy Lewis shared with me in a class one time, Birth of a Campus. It was about UCI and the birth of this institution. And it followed Dan Aldridge around. And it was amazing to me that Dan Aldridge was talking about the importance of diversity or water being a future problem or the environment being something that we need to safeguard. Talking about all these issues in 1964, 65, when this was done. And these are all still the relevant issues that need help today, more so than ever before. And so being a part of this institution and institutions in education, I always talk about, my, my father used to say, education versus ignorance. That's what you're dealing with out in the world. And so I would rather be on the side of education. Um, that we have the opportunity here to touch people's lives in a, maybe a small, small way, maybe sometimes a big way, 
And I think sometimes people want to get on Instagram so they can get the big way going or make that big influence. But I think in very subtle ways, what we're hoping to do here with students that graduate or go to UC Irvine and, and persist is that they go off and they be outstanding community members in whatever way they can be, whether that's being the, the soccer parent on the weekend or how they bring people in and are inclusive in the boardroom or how they are creating something of magnificence that's going to help change the world when it comes to research and everything in between that. And so I think that our students are leaders and they're going to go off and continue to be leaders and change their leadership as they grow. But I firmly believe that they will be influencing others. And so what better way to influence others than to do that in a positive way, to improve the conditions of the world that we live in. And so as an educator, I'm always trying to like nudge in that direction. And again, you know, I don't think, no one's doing a TV show about me or anything like that, but I feel like I'm in a profession that at least allows me to have a, an impact. And it makes me feel like I have purpose, you know, that this is giving me purpose. This is, I've fallen into the purpose that I've, you know, that I'm a part of right now. And everyone's purpose that when they leave you see, I might be very different than that, but my hope would be that they're out there and influencing the world, making the, this world a better place. And that's ultimately what I would like to uh, see happen. And you know, the other thing is I think our students have the opportunity to really engage their passions. So if they're passionate about uh, an issue, they can join a club about that issue. If there's not one that exists, they can start a club around that issue. They can find like-minded students to really rally around an issue, whether it's a, about hunger or homelessness, or whether it's about global politics, or whether it's about racism and anti-blackness, or whether it's about you name it. They can coalition, they can find other people like themselves, they can have that passion kind of come to life. And I think that that's another exciting element of why you know it's important. So, I mean, I think ultimately the world needs the help and what better group to help the world than students, students who are educated, students who are gonna influence others as they leave UC Irvine. And so they go from anteaters to ant leaders, like I like to always say. <laughs> and people try to laugh and I go, okay, uh, you know, it's okay. But that's what I like to say, but I, I really do hopefully believe that. And so that's what uh, gives me purpose. So what can I add that hasn't been said already? Um, I, I think, so I think maybe I'm gonna answer it a little differently, right? Uh, you know, one of the things that now exists is so many identity centers, right? When I was a student, it was just a cross-cultural center. So many centers have popped up in, the two, in these 2000s, right? We have the Center for Black Cultures and Resources. We have the Student Outreach and Retention Center. Uh, the Women's Center for Success has come back, you know, disappeared and come back in a reimagined way. The Latinx Resource Center, the Dream Center. Right? I'm working in a space that's called Rooted in Student Empowerment because all of these spaces came because of student activism, because students asked for it, because they petitioned, they met, they met with folks. Um, at, you know, for, for, cert, for certain groups there was demands, right? often known as, as the VSU um, demands. Uh, and so really it was because of these um, initiatives that have happened and right now we currently have administrators on this campus actively rooting to how do we bring more right where is there an asian american islander pacific islander center where is an um, american indian indigenous center right and so what we need is student voices as part of that to students to activate and start asking for that to help support the faculty that are currently have been grant writing, right? Um, and, and looking for funds to fund this. Uh, so uh, so I, I think that's what I wanna leave with is, is the, uh, the opportunities that still exist for students to see themselves in this space, right? As our population further diversifies on this campus, um, wanting students to feel seen and see your programs, your your history, your culture on the campus. I think there's different types of leadership. There's just uh, charismatic leadership. There's uninhibited artistic leadership. There's quiet leadership. I would say I was born with an artistic, uninhibited leadership. And I remember just being uninhibited in Korea as a little girl who wants to sing here? I'm like, me, 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 me. 
and just belting it out, no, no problem. Uh, so from in Jenny Doe 2.0 in Bakersfield, of course, I wanted to fly under the radar. So that uninhibited, charismatic little girl flew under the radar. So identity before coming to the university, mom and dad said, your identity, it's that of a student. You are a student. You will be a student and you will get A's and you will do things for security. So uh, th then at the university, um, uh, discovering myself by uh, hanging out in proximity to people uh, that are Asian American and other um, diverse cultures. I spent a lot of time at the Cross Cultural Center and uh, I think my uh, years of trying to fly under the radar, I, that just, I, it, it, the blanket just flew off and I became uninhibited again and felt that I could express myself and protest and, and all of this and become a real rabble rouser. I wanna say that years later, after I served as student regent and after Jack Peltison, my then chancellor, helped me a lot during that experience, I one time found him and I in a room and I said, Chancellor, I wanna apologize for having tortured you so much. And he said, he patted me on the back and he says, you know, Jenny, we all have a role to play in different seasons of our lives. And I think basically what he was telling me is, is that it's okay, it's okay to feel that passion and, and charismatic, uninhibited, I'm gonna, I'm gonna occupy your office, Chancellor, to make this point about ethnic studies because th that impassioned, extreme voice is how we get to compromise. And the middle doesn't exist unless the passion exists. And so I felt like that was, that was what I got from Chancellor Peltison saying, we all have a role to play. And I want to believe that students of today, yesterday, and tomorrow, there's a role for extreme voices because that's how we get to compromise um, through that. I would consider myself a quiet leader. <laughs> um, growing up, I was just quiet in general. I wasn't a leader at all. Um, and I think a big part of that was just feeling kind of alone in my identity um, as a black biracial person, which comes with a great deal of privilege. Um, but in a white area, a chiefly white area, I felt very ostracized and alone. And I very much tried to fly under the radar for most of my life uh, until I got into college and I was exposed to more people who looked like me. And there was, I mean, when I came to UCI, I was surprised by how many black students were on campus until I learned that there was a very small percentage on campus. <laughs> and that's where we came up with the name 2.5 because of the tiny percentage of black students um, on UC campuses. And um, obviously though, I don't understand the full degree of what blackness means due to my own privilege as a biracial person. I was fully embraced by the black community here and I was embraced and encouraged to speak, you know, and um, though I am a quiet person by nature, I felt that I could still speak to what was going on within the community and within the world around me and um, and also listen. Listening is a great part of being a leader, as Jenny has said, and I felt that within my own position of privilege, my personal way of being a leader was listening and providing a microphone to others, and I think that's an important part of being a leader, and is lending your privilege and your microphone to people who need it and can really amplify issues that you care about. Tatum, Jenny, Ramin, and Adelie, I just wanted to thank you again so much for giving us your time and your energy tonight. So let's give them a nice warm round of applause.